Fantastic. All right. So welcome to the Marketing Club. Uh, we do the Marketing Club to encourage our students to continue to learn and create some, uh, you know, a type of community um, that is not necessarily um, based in getting a grade. Um, while the information is relevant, those students that are enthusiastic about the topic of marketing, we want to encourage them to come. So if you're a faculty member or, you know, somebody, it's imperative and helpful if we share the information out to our courses, let students know what's going on. Um, and for the first time ever, we've, we've also uh, created a link where you could actually share that with outsiders, people outside of the um, university that might be interested in that topic. So I'll give it over. To, I'll give it over to um, Eric Freeman, and he can do a little discussion on who he is, kind of introduce himself, and then move right on into his topic. Hey everyone, good morning. My name is uh, Eric Freeman, and uh, how is everyone doing this morning? Doing great, Eric. I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for asking. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you, Suzanne. So a um, little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a marketing instructor. I'm also a consultant and I'm a former director of marketing for my family business. My family business, J.A. Freeman and Son, used to manufacture hay baling and hay handling equipment. And believe it or not, we were in business for over 110 years. And uh, that's a lot of years for a small manufacturer. Um, so I, I had the opportunity to be the director of marketing for that particular business and really oversee the marketing plans for our domestic as well as, as, well as global marketing um, strategies. And we were competing in well over uh, 20 global markets. I'm super excited about the opportunity to be here this morning. And we are going to do some brainstorming this morning. Marketers brainstorm. I love the brainstorming process because you never know what you are going to come up with. It's a very creative experience. And what we are going to do is we are going to put together a marketing strategy for a hypothetical online bookstore, okay? And this will be fully online. We are not going to have any retail exposure, but first, Let's look at the definition of a traditional marketing strategy. Generally speaking, it is a target market plus a marketing mix. So the goal is to create a marketing mix that will appeal to a certain group of folks and do it better than your competitors. So you're going to develop product strategies, pricing strategies, promotional strategies, and place strategies. And for our purposes today, we are going to focus on product price and promotion. All right, so here's our little bookstore. <laughs> and this will be an online bookstore, okay? And we are going to need to develop a website for this bookstore. Now, has anyone ever heard of the three-click rule? Anyone? Going once, going nope. twice? Nope, haven't heard Okay, of it. the three click rule. So there's nothing more frustrating. Have you ever been to a website that was poorly designed and you spend a couple of minutes looking around, you can't find what you're supposed to, you're, you're, you're unable to find what you're looking for on this website. And so you end up saying the heck with it, leaving the website and going to another company's website, right? That's happened to all of us, I think. And the three click rule means that you should be able to find what you're looking for within three clicks of the mouse. And if you can't, that's one indicator that that website is poorly designed because you have a couple of seconds, just like when you go in for a job interview, you have a couple of seconds to make a great first impression. The same goes with a website. So we need to make sure we design a user-friendly website. To start this business too, as part of this process, of course, it's much more detailed than just, just this, but for our purposes, we will certainly need to conduct a SWOT analysis as well as a competitive analysis. And for my former family business, I used to do this on a quarterly basis. SWOT analysis, as we know, helps to fine tune the company strategy. So we're looking at internal and external variables as well as a competitive analysis. 
For example, it allows you to look at strengths and weaknesses of your competitors. And working for my former family business, I always enjoy identifying weaknesses, competitor weaknesses. For example, let's say that you are competing in the cable television industry. Now, what are some weaknesses with some of the uh, players in that industry? We know that customer service is not very good, right? Traditionally in that industry, a lot of cable companies have horrible customer service. So if you are a new company entering that industry or an existing company, what does that mean to you? That means, to you, that, means that you can take advantage of that weakness by having better customer service, right? And you know, few companies truly have top-notch customer service, so that can be a sustainable competitive advantage. Okay, let's get into doing a little brainstorming. Are you ready? We are going to define our target market now for simplicity purposes. Our target market, we are going to carry products, educational products for families with children. Okay, so that is, broadly speaking, we're going to target families with children and provide them with educational kind of products. And let's dig into the product line. So if we are targeting families with children, what kind of products should we carry? What do you think? I mean, we're going to have books, but what kind of books and what other products should we carry? Educational books. Yes, educational books, right? And they should be traditional books. Should we have some, you know, books that are electronic? We probably should. Um, should we carry other products like, um, let's see, school backpacks? What about that with our logo on the backpacks? Okay, yeah. and, what, and what other products? Any other products you, you can think of? I don't know, maybe uh, um, notebooks. Notebooks. Lanyards. Yep. Pens. Pens with, with our name on it. Yep. Maybe even uh, hats, uh, caps, maybe, possibly. Um, we probably could come up with other products in we're certainly, as part of our branding efforts, going to need to put our, put our name on those products as we transform. Just like you see folks walking out of Starbucks with those fancy cups with Starbucks name on, we're transforming our customers into walking billboards, which is a good way to increase awareness. We should have our name, we should have our website address um, on these products. Now, naturally, we might not have those on the books, but we can certainly put them on the backpacks, mm -hmm and other related products. Okay, how should we determine an appropriate pricing strategy for our company? What do you think? There's so many different pricing strategies. Captive, mm -hmm. odd even, skimming, penetration. How should we determine an appropriate pricing strategy? I'll use the uh, competitive pricing strategy, Eric. Okay, and what do you like best about a competitive pricing strategy? Yeah, because it's, there's a possibility that you already have the same kind of product mix out there from other competitors. So you want to make sure that you are as close as possible, unless you have some something special that will kind of make you more have an, a competitive edge that, that might increase your price to that level that at least they might be able to get value for whatever they are paying for the particular item. So. Right, right. And we're going to need, of course, factor in break even points and demographics and right. whatnot into this. But I like it. I like a competitive pricing strategy. And you're absolutely right in that if we had, if we were, for example, creating a bookstore that were, we were simply selling collectibles, then of course, we're talking about much higher price points. We're probably getting into skimming pricing strategies and whatnot. Um, another pricing strategy we might even consider when and of course, we have to look at the competition. We have some heavy hitters in this mm -hmm. industry, so we have to look at the competition, but we might even consider a penetration pricing strategy as well. 
which is used yeah. with new companies entering a, a market and they don't have any market share. So how do you get market share? One way to do that is to undercut the competition on price for a time, hopefully, and um, use a penetration pricing strategy to acquire and build your customer base. Um, you know, we, we saw Netflix do that to Blockbuster Video years ago. And, you know, Blockbuster had that tremendous retail overhead and it just, it couldn't compete on price. And Netflix came in and figured out a way to get the product to the consumer at lower price points in a more convenient manner. And it was just the perfect mix and Blockbuster couldn't compete. And Netflix just grabbed a ton of um, mm. market, sh market share from uh, Blockbuster Video. Okay, so let's go with a competitive pricing strategy. Um, now, here we have this website. And by the way, we've created a wonderful website. It's super user friendly, but we have one problem. We don't have any awareness. We're out there in, in, with a zillion other websites. How are we going to pull traffic to our website? What are your thoughts? Social media advertising. That is an awesome idea. We can advertise, we can leverage social media. What I love best about social media is it's cost, it can be cost effective if properly implemented. Right. It, if you look at Super Bowl advertisements, you're not going to see small businesses advertising during the Super Bowl. It's just not going to happen. You're going to see medium to large, mostly large businesses with heavy budgets advertising during the Super Bowl. Um, however, with social media, I do believe it levels the playing field a bit more so we can compete with larger companies on a global basis. So I really like the idea um, of social media and, you know, generating that viral advertising and, um, you know, website traffic, as well as implementing a search engine optimization strategy. Mm -hmm. Super important is, is one of the best ways. Um, to consistently pull traffic to our website and maybe a little uh, guerrilla marketing as well because you know we might not have a very big budget we're certainly not going to be able to launch a national television campaign or radio campaign so you know we have to really look at return on investment when it comes to pulling traffic to our site okay all right, so we, we're pulling traffic to our site. Now, as part of this process, how can we build customer relationships? Should we have a grand opening? And if, and if so, what would be included in our grand opening? A lot of companies do grand openings, new companies. Well, yeah, I think it can be beneficial depending on the nature of your company, but um... A lot of times you want to get people to come in and see it for the first time, offer some free goodies, um, activities, things that would draw your core demographic to come visit, do things, maybe a guest speaker, um, an author, something like that. Yes, that's a fantastic idea. And, and Suzanne just said some type of special promotion. Um, Suzanne, what kind of promotion do you have in mind? Because sales promotions will be part of our grand opening. So we can, like Murad just said, we can discount a lot of products maybe for the first month, first month and a half. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at grand openings, like if you look at a traditional company like Jimmy John's, Jimmy John's competes with Subway, Jersey Mike's, Firehouse Subs, the list goes on and on. But what Jimmy John's does when they launch a new franchise is they literally just give product away for the first month mm -hmm. or two. They go out to local businesses and give sub sandwiches away. And they're waiting for that reciprocity to kick in. And that's a great, and some might say, well, that's expensive, it is, but it's part of, it's, it's investing. It's investing in quickly building your customer base, which is super important. Um, because then if you have a healthy customer ba base, word of mouth finally kicks in, word starts to get around in our case, hopefully by viral advertising. And now we are, you know, really increasing our customer base. Um, and Suzanne said some type of online loyalty program. And let me just ask you all this, why is it important? I know this may sound like an obvious question, 
but it's really not when you unpack it. Why is it important for companies to have a customer loyalty program? Well, if nobody's going to answer, I'm going to throw one in there because it's much cheaper to keep your customers than it is to uh, get new ones. You get a better it, return on investment. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. If you are able to maintain your market share, of, you know, your market share um, benchmark, then you theoretically, you have all the customers you, you need, correct? So you don't have to have amp, you know, you don't have to increase your promotional budget. You can let that fall a little bit because you've got all the customers you need. And uh, it's super important because it's expensive to go out and acquire new customers. So you're really trying to retain your customers so that the company can realize customer lifetime value. And also with a customer loyalty program, the beauty of it is it provides us with data. It provides us with customer data. Um, that we can download into our customer database, do a little data mining, create customer profiles. And like a company like Amazon, when you purchase a book, uh, let's say you're into sci-fi, uh, sci you purchase a bunch of sci-fi books, the next time you go back to Amazon, suddenly on the page, it has all these recommendations. And so Amazon's probably using an advanced CRM program or whatnot, but it is able to predict your future purchasing patterns. And that's super important as part of a customer loyalty program. And also it provides us with additional demographic information. Let's say we have birthdays. We have our customers' birthdays. What can we do with birthdays? Anyone, if we know our customers' birthdays? Let's send them a bad day, you know, greetings, something like that, or even offer them some discount because it's their bad day. Just something to keep them loyal to the, I mean, to your brand and to the program entirely. I think it's always good. Just like what we did in our brand program, we kind of send a, a happy birthday wishes to our associate faculty members, just to let them know that we remember them, we appreciate their business and their, you know, cooperation, their involvement in our students' uh, quality of uh, education. So we can do that to customers too. We are dealing with products, so. Exactly. And with those birthdays, we can, just like you mentioned, we can send out a special sales promotion on a birthday, maybe a free book or whatnot, up to a certain price point, um, or a free t-shirt, or a free, uh, dis a major discount on a, on a backpack, or, or, or whatnot. And that's just a great way to foster uh, customer loyalty. And also with a customer loyalty program, it gives us the opportunity to have, I mean, we can certainly tie in extra benefits. Murad said earlier about having guest speakers, which I think is super important, especially for targeting families with children. We could mm -hmm. have a um, famous book author um, come in as part of the customer loyalty program. You have to be part of this program because we're going to make this more exclusive we can have a, um, a storytelling hour or a half hour for children. Now, how, how cool would that be? Come to the website, you can watch some sort of storytelling. Maybe, maybe down the road, we can you know, upload that to YouTube and of course, keep it on our website, but that's just an additional value added service we can provide to our customers and really foster um, customer loyalty. We can also create an e-newsletter. Is anyone a fan of e-newsletters? What should we include in an e-newsletter to families? New books, uh, new educational books that just came out that they might not be aware of, how uh, any of the brands or the uh, titles can be beneficial to, this, uh, to their children, even to their parents too. So. Those are the kind of thing you can include in the newsletter. You can tell them about any promotional activities that might be coming up or that is happening right now. They don't want to lose that. You should take advantage of that. And in some cases, you can even put a coupon of maybe, you know, 20% off through into the newsletter if you have space for it, just to kind of create the awareness that, you know, you have this operation, uh, promotion going on right now. So a lot of things you can put in the e newsletter, which can be sent to their, I mean, to their emails or any other 
uh, um, uh, media avenues that you want to use to reach them through the letter. So. Exactly. Those are all wonderful ideas. And what I really enjoy about what you just stated is we are providing, we're not just you know, creating a newsletter with a bunch of sales promotions, right? We are actually adding value added information to that newsletter, such as promoting new books that are coming up, or maybe we could even have, um, you know, have um, a book uh, reviews as well as part of this newsletter and, and some kind of teasers in there to get folks to come back to our website as well as, and Suzanne mentioned as well, um, we can have coupons and other special sales promotions as part of the e-newsletter. And the beauty of the e-newsletter too is that it helps to keep our brand top of mind so that mm -hmm. folks, folks remember that they need to go visit our website. Okay, and then finally, customer service, which I think is super important. I, I just, I, I believe, in any in industry, I believe that customer service is super important. If I ask you to come up with 10 companies that have absolutely exceptional customer ser service, I'm sure that you'd have trouble coming up with five, honestly. If I asked you to come up with 10 companies that have kind of horrible to lukewarm customer <laughs> service, I don't think you'd have any problem. <laughs> so customers, mm -hmm. customer service is important. So what kind of customer service policy should we create? I mean, how quickly should we get back to email questions? What kind of, what kind of customer service should we provide our customers? Well, I would say this, that uh, much of this is dependent on what your customers actually want. So Costco customers want something very different than let's say your local bookstore um, local, local bookstore. Obviously, they're going to want, um, depending on the size of your business also, um, you might have some metrics about speed of getting back to customers, but in small bookstores, you're definitely going to want to have uh, customer service, uh, positive customer service, more helpful customer service, uh, people who are knowledgeable about the books and they're able to make recommendations. You're gonna to wanna to handle these things probably in a bookstore, very one-on-one -on -one, um, sort of basis. Because uh, chances are you're appealing to people in the local area, right, so. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you know, uh, Eric and um, Murad and uh, Susan, I think the, the beauty of customer service now based on the new technologies that it's so, it's, everything is automated. I mean, if your customer asks for something through the help uh, button on your on the website, then it's it's quickly automated to let them know we did receive your complaint or we did receive this and that, and they will get back to you as soon as possible. I think that's a lot better than waiting for 24 hours before you kind of go and respond to them. Immediacy is the most important thing when it comes to customer service. As long as the customer is communicating with you, all is well. You can take 30 days, you can take 20 days, as long as they are talking and you are responding accordingly, I think you should be okay with customer service. They will respect you for that, yeah. And they stay with your brand. Exactly, and you know, we can certainly use some automated tools to automate some mm -hmm. of the customer service, for sure. And that makes sense. It will save us money in the long run too, as well, and better care for our customers. Um, and, you know, in our policy, make sure that we, you know, if we say we are going to get back to you in 24 hours or 48 hours or five hours to make sure that we are getting back in a timely manner with our customers so that we're able to uh, retain those customers. And I do believe that it provides us with the opportunity because we might be bumping into larger competitors. Um, because we're small, we have the ability to really focus in on providing that quality um, customer service and will help us to uh, differentiate if we bump into some heavy hitters in this, uh, this industry. But, you know, customer service certainly does tie right back into building long-term customer relationships. Great idea. Great ideas. All right, everyone. That concludes our brainstorming session on creating a strategy for an online bookstore. This was a, a lot of fun. And I love, brain, I love brainstorming because we were all able to come up with some really great ideas. Thank you, Eric. Uh, yeah, I think it's fascinating. And you know, I think this information is pretty beneficial for some of our students too. So 
Um, I'm going to see if we can do something about that. But let me officially officially sign off here in terms of stopping the recording and we can continue to con converse afterwards if necessary. But I just want to thank everybody who has to go um, for coming and that please stay tuned because we do these on a regular basis. Um, thank you guys. And uh, those who want to hang out for a few minutes, please do so. I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah. Now.